When people think about what ancient Romans wore, they often think the Romans must have dressed very differently from people today. To some extent, they're right, but when we take a closer look at Roman fashion, we can be amazed at the similarities between ancient and modern clothing. Actual garments from the ancient world did not generally survive, though, so in order to understand Roman fashion and hairstyles, we're lucky that we can look at ancient statuary, which often gives the best detail and a 360-degree view, whereas paintings often offer less detail and provide only one visual perspective. Look at these sandals, for example, on this statue of the Empress Agrippina. They don't look any different from a sandal we can find in stores today. In fact, the style called gladiator sandals is often very similar to this, with its strappy appearance leaving the foot open. These sandals are from an Etruscan male's burial site, and so they're an extremely ancient example of actual footwear. While they're very decayed, although they aren't bad for more than 2,500 years old, they're an amazing and exceptional example of the craftsmanship in the ancient world, and they also demonstrate that the basic structure of footwear hasn't really changed at all. Consider these fibulae. Fibulae are pins used to hold garments in place at the shoulder. They're the original form of safety pins and kilt pins that we still use today. They haven't changed much, except that the Roman versions were often larger in order to hold volumes of fabric. As you can see from these fibulae, the pins could sometimes offer a lot of space so that quite a lot of fabric could be gathered into the pin before it was closed. The long shaft on many pins is used to hide the sharp end so that the wearer doesn't get stuck, just like we have on safety pins used today. This is a particularly nice fibula. Made from gold, it bears one of the oldest Latin inscriptions ever found. The contrast between this gold fibula and the previous bronze ones demonstrates the variety available. Just like today, there were options for every budget. When thinking about clothing and adornment, just as today, we have to think about what cloth was used to make the clothing and how it was decorated. In the ancient world, if you could afford it, you'd have your clothing embroidered with gold thread. This was fabric filament, just like thread today, which had a very fine and delicate golden thread spun in with it. This is a picture of a pile of such gold thread. It's a little difficult to see because of the glass case, but we can recognize its delicate structure. A wealthy Roman could have her or his garment embroidered with this gold thread in a variety of designs which were popular throughout classical antiquity. We might think that this is a waste of gold because clothing eventually wears out. The Romans thought of that, though and could simply burn the garments when they were worn out. This would burn away the fabric, but leave behind the melted gold, which could then be reused. These statues present perfect examples of dress types worn in ancient Greece, but also sometimes found in Rome. The garment was called a chiton in ancient Greece, and was generally made from one piece of fabric. It's created by folding the fabric so that there is a flap at the top and pinning it in place. In fact, one of these women is depicted pinning her garment at the shoulder. This makes for a dress full of beautiful draped fabric, which is held with fibulae and would also be belted, called girdled. The Doric chiton like these had no sleeves. The Ionic chiton was made with wider fabric, which could be fastened along the arm to make sleeves. The belt would be tied either at the waist or beneath the bust. The dress on the left appears to be double girdled, which allowed a second fold of fabric falling down below the waist. This statue shows us a beautiful, delicate pala, a long piece of fabric which could be worn like a cloak or cape by Roman women, and it was often pulled over the head to guard against the weather or for religious purposes, rather like a hoodie today. If we look at the fabric over the woman's head, the softness and delicacy of the fabric is clear. The dress itself is also beautifully shown in the statue. Generally, Roman women would not wear their garments off the shoulder, as this statue shows, but even today when we see modern fashion shows, the women are wearing their clothing in a way which displays the qualities of the fabric or style, not always the way the average woman would wear them. The delicacy of this fabric is clear from the way we can see the form through the cloth. This is not a thick wool, but it likely depicts a fine linen or even silk brought from the east through the trade routes. The abundance of the folds and the way the dress pools at the bottom indicates that generally such dresses involved quite a lot of fabric and were long enough to pool at the feet. A working woman, such as one who worked in a taberna or shop, would likely not be wearing such an elaborate dress or one with so much fabric for practical reasons. 
Women of lower income could also not afford to wear the more expensive fabrics, and often just wore a tunica or stola with a simple cloak. In this statue, too, we can see the pala covering the woman's hair, along with a belt tied tightly beneath the bust, called high-waisted, rather like an empire waistline still popular today. The belt helped hold the folds in place and gave a shape to the dress by suggesting the figure beneath. The belt also had practical reasons for being used. It would have been difficult to function in such great volumes of fabric without fastening it closer to the body. This statue remnant in Porphyry shows the complexity of the fabric in the drapery. The volumes of folds and gathers shows us how important abundant fabric was in ancient clothing. The loose fabric was a little cooler in a hot climate, but it also meant that the clothing fit women of various sizes. The belting was what adjusted it to the body. In this statue fragment, we can see the sleeves of a Roman stola, the primary dress worn by Roman women. This is a challenging feature to see in statuary because it is often covered by the pala. This stola is a dress with sleeves, which usually had delicate gathers along the upper arm held in place with decorative clasps, as shown in this statue. The sleeves may have been attached to an underdress called a tunica intima, rather like a modern slip. This woman's wearing a pala covering her head, which may be anchored to the diadem in her hair. Practically speaking, there would need to be some pin to keep it in place, or the diadem may also catch the fabric of the pala and hold it. This statue shows more of a Grecian-style dress with layers of asymmetrical fabric held in folds over one arm. It illustrates the classical taste for voluminous folds. Here we can see the pala draped more fully around a figure. This could have been for purposes of warmth, but also might indicate a figure involved in a religious ceremony, where women and men were usually covered more fully, particularly their heads. Here we see early male garments. This statue represents an Etruscan or Phrygian style of male dress, where the man is wearing a Phrygian cap, a tunic rather like a long t-shirt, a cloak hanging from his shoulders, and leggings above a pointed shoe. This is a very early male outfit, predating the Roman Republic. Here is a similar male statue. The Phrygian or Etruscan cap is clearly visible, and in this case the man is wearing a long sleeve tunic belted above the waist, leggings held in place with laces tied up the legs, sandals, and a long cloak hanging from his shoulders. The statue is striking in the clarity of the clothing depicted, and it combines a beautiful dark marble for the face and hands with a textured marble for the clothing. The choice makes it almost look like real fabric. In this bust, we see the Phrygian cap close up. It's a challenging hat to create because of its shape and the fact that it must stand up by itself. Early in Rome's history, it seems that male hairstyles often involved long, loose curls, as you can see here. Here we see the transition to the Republic itself, where a man of means and influence would not be seen without his toga wrapped in careful folds around him. Male hair at this time was also cut closely. It is more sternly cut. This statue of Augustus shows him wearing a tunic, like a long t-shirt with short sleeves, and carefully wrapped in a toga which covers his head. This was standard for a man to wear during religious events and reflected piety and humility. We can see how challenging it would have been to wrap this garment. It was approximately 25 meters of fabric. An upper-class man would have had a highly skilled slave wrap his toga around his body so that it crossed one shoulder and contained a number of pockets. Each pocket was called a sinus. A Roman man could actually use the sinus as a pocket and carry things in it. In these statues we see a typical male hairstyle cut close to the head with small curls framing his face. This famous statue of a male figure shows a similar short style very much like any seen today. It's a little longer and with looser curls than some of the others we can see. With these statues, we see a variety of male styles, all of which were closely cut, but which layered the curls in very inventive ways. This statue of the Emperor Vespasian shows him with very little hair. He wears a very abundant laurel wreath as a symbol of his authority, but it also helps take emphasis away from his hair. Today, this would be the equivalent of wearing a baseball cap to cover a bad hair day or hair loss. This statue of Antinous, the favorite of the Emperor Hadrian, shows him clean-shaven, as was the style of the Republic and the early Empire, yet his hair is a little long and has very loose curls. 
since he is a young man he can wear such a style which is today there are longer styles more common for younger men than for older ones generally speaking when we see statues of men with shaggy hair and beards they're usually celts or gauls roman men before the time of hadrian were generally always clean shaven and kept their hair trimmed neatly this statue is of a Celtic man referred to as a barbarian, just meaning beard wearer. His appearance suggests a rough life and likely defeat and conquest. This is one of the most famous such statues called the Dying Gaul. Depicted in the final moments of his life, he has luxurious hair and a full mustache not typical of a Roman man at the time. His appearance is meant to contrast with what a civilized Roman man would have looked like but the viewer today is left thinking how very modern he looks and was left very moved by his expression. Here's another, the Gaul killing himself and his wife. He also has very abundant hair and a full mustache, an appearance not acceptable for a Roman man of rank and influence at the time. This male figure features a very modern hairstyle, longer and combed from the center. We can imagine seeing this style in any magazine. In addition, the man's beard is neatly trimmed and carefully groomed. He's a poet, and so he could have a more free appearance, influenced by a Greek style. This is another poet allowed to have a longer hairstyle and short beard. The Emperor Hadrian grew his hair longer and had a beard. He was a soldier, and this was not uncommon because of the conditions during campaign. He kept his beard when he became emperor as a statement of his independence from Roman expectations. He broke the ice, and he made beards fashionable. Later emperors, such as Antoninus Pius, depicted here, wore their hair in longer curls with full beards. Probably the most famous female hairstyle from antiquity is this one, Medusa's hair made of snakes. Of course, the mythology behind this image doesn't really show the daily reality, which was that Roman women had so many styles to choose from that were often amazed at the complexity and elaborateness of their ancient hair. We start with this statue, showing a style very like a ponytail with a simple twist on each side. And here we have a loose bun. The hair looks fairly short, gathered in loose curls with twists along the head. Again, this is not an unusual style by today's standards. What is unusual today is this style, very popular among the upper class women. Clearly it required significant hair extensions, which were widely available in ancient Rome. Just as today, Ancient women could purchase real human hair sold by the owner, who was either a slave or someone who sold her hair as a means of income. An ornatrix, or hairdresser, who was usually a slave, would be responsible to create the hairstyle using the extensions, balanced high over the forehead in delicate piles of curls. This woman's own hair would form the base for the extensions and would be used to create the rear of the hairstyle. Here we see a simpler style, more like a bun, but pulling the hair into braided plates. A plate is a section of hair. The front is what is particularly distinctive. It was popular, especially in the early empire, to take a plate of hair, sweep it toward the front, and fold it back on itself, tucking it into the bun. This lovely hairstyle pulls the hair away from the forehead and twists and gathers it into a simple bun at the back with loose curls hanging from the nape. The bangs are cut short and curled, and the hair is combed into distinctive sections. Overall, though, it doesn't look very different from a style we could see today. This statue features a hairstyle which is similar to one popular in Regency England about 200 years ago. There are lovely ringlets at the temples, and the hair is tied into a bun. It's held in place with ribbons called fillets, which were twisted around the woman's head in decorative patterns to hold hair close to the head, while allowing little tendrils to hang down elsewhere. Here's another style which would likely have involved hair extensions to create the braids around the crown of the head. The hair is divided into plates which are twisted around the head and gathered into a Gordian looking knot at the crown. From the front, this style looks fairly straightforward, but seen from the side, we can see the complexity. It has two different levels of hair. There's a second layer behind the knot and we can see the elaborate twists brought together to create this beautiful crown of hair. This would definitely have needed the assistance of an ornatrix to make happen. This statue shows the hair divided into plates and twisted back from the hairline into a braided bun. While the artist faces a challenge in depicting the braid at the back, it's clear to see that the braids have not changed very much over the years. We still like to fold plated sections of hair into decorative designs. This statue shows a popular Roman hairstyle with really good detail. 
The front is created from curls piled high, much easier to depict in stone than would be to create in real hair. From the back, though, we can see an amazing combination of braided plates pulled together into a swirl. The artist uses a drill to depict the curls at the front, and we can see that they would have been amazingly abundant and soft. This style is a bit more severe, but it still uses elaborate braids pulled together. It isn't actually that different from some of the braided or woven hairstyles popular today. They can be pulled back or left loose. An ancient woman, though, would not leave her hair loose ever unless she were in mourning. She had to keep it neatly and elaborately styled as a reflection of her status and respectability. This statue is another using soft waves of curl around the face, really similar to styles popular in the 1920s and 30s in North America and Europe. And here's another example in dark stone, which is really impressive. This one seems to combine two different stylistic approaches, loose curls underneath and smooth waves over top. And this hairstyle looks a bit more like a 1700s aristocratic wig. This sculpture is so well detailed that we can see the braids as they start at the base of the hair, and we can see they're made from three plated strands braided together and then pulled around the head. The hair at the front would have been cut to a specific length to allow it to be built up to the desired height once it was curled. You might be asking how did they hold all of this in place? Not to worry, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We can also see that the braids stop right behind the ear. Likely this was to allow for the bottom hair to be made into a bun beneath the structure, and then the braids could be anchored into the bun and held in place. The small tendrils at the nape of the neck make this hairstyle especially elegant and delicate. Just as we notice that modern hairstyles have varied in terms of volume or size, we can see that Roman women using this style like to build the front curls higher and higher. Just like in the 80s, Women were known for big hair. Some Roman women found it impressive to see just how big they could make their hairstyles. And now for how they held it on place. Here we can see an ancient spin pin. This pin could be used as hair jewelry and it would also hold the hair together just by twisting it into the plates that you want to hold. The Romans are also believed to have used honey like a type of hairspray or styling product, touching it to the strands they wanted to hold together. The Romans had a variety of types of hair pins they used hairnets of varying complexity and expense. You may have seen this famous painting of a Roman woman wearing a golden hairnet. Examples have been found like these ones made from gold thread woven into a net which could be pinned over a bun or over the crown of the head to hold a style in place. The nets could be made more elaborate with jewels or beads depending on the wealth of the wearer. It's also possible that the hair could have been sewn in place using a needle and string which approximated the hair color of the wearer this would make total sense and would have been very effective. Roman women had mirrors to check their appearance, just as we do today. There are abundant examples of highly polished bronze mirrors with decorative backs which Roman women loved to use in their daily grooming regimen. The style of these mirrors didn't change very much throughout history, even into the late 20th century. Here we see an ancient Roman comb. We can still buy combs which look exactly like these. It's accompanied by an ancient hairpin, just like those still found today to hold buns or twists of hair in place. Roman women also used diadems to hold their hair in place, as well as being personal adornment. These would have functioned much like modern hair bands. Here we can see a collection belonging to an ancient Roman girl. She had jewelry and gold and precious gems, along with a decorative hairpin in the bottom left with a sculpted top. And to finish the look, delicate necklaces, bracelets, rings like these were very popular with Roman women. They wouldn't look at all out of place on today's jewelry table. Here we can see particularly distinctive Roman jewelry. Gold arm bracelets in the shape of snakes were very popular. Their soft metal could be adjusted to fit around the wearer's arms so that they would stay in place. In addition, we can see a bulla on the center right side. This is a protective amulet, which was primarily worn by boys, but also could be worn by girls. Its power was believed to protect the growing child until he or she reached adulthood, when it was ceremonially taken off and put away to mark the rite of passage of growing up. The styles and artistry of ancient clothing and hair demonstrate incredible skill and complexity. In an age today, when the industries surrounding personal adornment, beauty, and fashion command billions of dollars of investment worldwide, it's easy to understand how fashion and hairstyles represent an eternal human expression. 
This expression not only allows us to assert our individuality, but it also allows us to identify with a group, a culture, a social class. This is abundantly clear in looking back at the ancient Roman world, and we're left to wonder, how can learning about ancient clothing and hairstyles from 2,000 years ago help us understand the very human motivation for personal decoration today?